So welcome, mate. Um, thanks so much for joining us for Bath College Music Industry Week. It's amazing to have someone like you, you know, join us at Bath College. It's my pleasure. Which is ace. We've got a lot of fans in the room of yours, probably me as well, which is good. So, yeah, happy days, happy good days. Stuff. So I think the first question, like, how did you get into it? What, do you want to tell us about yourself and Audio Animal and your impressive clients and everything? Um, so in terms of how I got into it, it was... I, 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 to be honest, I kind of fell into it. I wanted to be a DJ when I was, I left, I left school, didn't want to do the college thing. Not that you guys shouldn't, um, didn't want to do the college thing. Didn't want to go to university. Didn't want to do any of that. I wanted to just get out there into the world. Um, so I kind of, I, I kind of wanted to be a DJ. I wanted to be a producer. I quickly found out I wasn't that good at that. And when you're not good at something, find what you are good at. I was I had all the enthusiasm for it, but I weren't I, I, I am not a producer. Cool. Um so yeah, I basically ended up with making lots of connections with producers and then what do producers need? They need an engineer to make their music better. So it was a case of just literally going through, um, mixing track after track after track after leaving school. And then, you know, the thing is, is you can start a business. I've, I've had, before Audio Animals, I had two businesses. Both of them failed. So if you do want to start a business, be prepared to fail. But the, the, one, the one thing I always mm. tell people in, in, with regards to this is if you fail the first time, don't worry. Because it's, it's, it's kind of expected. The second one, doesn't matter if you fail the second time. As long as you succeed at some point. But the main thing is taking the knowledge of why you failed onto the next one. Working out why it is that you failed and then moving on mm -hmm. to the next business. And by the time you start your maybe third, fourth, fifth, maybe sixth, you'll, you'll have enough knowledge to know why you failed and make that one succeed. And um, the re I'll tell you the reasons why those businesses failed pri previously was it was more a case of where I was in my life in the sense that when I started the first business, I was 19. <clears throat> so I wasn't 100% wanting to make things succeed. I wanted to go out partying. I wanted to go out. I wanted to do everything else other than work. The last thing I actually wanted to do was do any work. But then... As you get a little bit older, you kind of get you find that mindset to really focus on something. And when look, and when the thing is, is when it's something you love. And look, I know I'm in a very, very fortunate situation where I'm at. So when you find something that you love and you can just do non-stop, I mean, if it look, if 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 it was a bank holiday Monday and I had a day off, this is where I'd be. You know, this is this is where I want to be on the the time I am I'm not working so this is like you know turning a hobby into a into a business into into your you know your main source of income is 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 the best thing you could ever do honestly it is um so yeah I kind of just went went through that went through multiple different businesses landed on this one this one was a massive success and uh yeah I mean it's just just it's, it's one of them things where it just starts off small and the best thing to do is it's like it's like having a baby Right, baby's small, and you build it. It grows and grows and grows, and then uh, you know it, it becomes mm. becomes something great. But yeah, that's that's kind so of. How long is it taking for you? How long? How long is it taking for your studio to be where it is at right now? Because you you've got full well, surround sound. Yeah, I mean the thing with the thing with in terms of the studio is like it, it's it's never finished. You know, mm. you could look at this studio and go, wow, it's amazing and, and see all the equipment that's in here. And, you know, I've got I've got I've got to a point now where I've got everything I want and everything else hasn't been invented yet. So I'm now working with companies to invent pieces of equipment that are totally unique and fit what I want because it's kind of I'm at a point where I can't buy another EQ because it's just another EQ. It's just another compressor. So it's like this is something that I want. So I'm working with Handy Amps at the moment and building them, building a new um, EQ. Um, and it's, it's incredible. It's, uh, it's, it's never been done before in the analog world. So it's something new and exciting. And that's, um, that's an avenue I didn't think I'd end up going down. Like, because uh, look, did they approach you for that? I approached them and said, look, I want a piece, this oh, piece cool. of equipment. Um, 
I want this piece of equipment. Um, this is the concept behind it. I've got no idea how to do it. I, I wouldn't even know where to start. And that's why that's one of the key things with with working in business is, yeah, you, you might be good at one thing and you're, you're terrible at another thing. So there's no reason you can't have someone who's who's good working with you, who's who's great at doing that side of things. You're great at that. And it's knowing where your strengths are. Mm, no, definitely. That's really cool. That's really yeah, so cool. Yeah, so we we started so, we started. Well, I say my 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 studio in a sense is 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 it something that's been building and growing for the past since I was sixteen. I'm thirty eight now, and I'm still not happy. I still want bigger, better, mm -hmm. and you'll never ever. I'll be I'll be fifty, sixty years old, and I guarantee you, I'll still be looking for more and more stuff to put in. That will never stop. I mean, that's, I, 100 percent 100 percent do you buy a lot of plugins as well or is it more just out of the box yeah yeah i buy, I buy you know the thing with the thing with it is is uh, there's always this debate about analog versus digital which one's better it's not a case of which one's better they've both got pros and cons you know analog's great for its sound its tone digital's great for its flexibility and there's far more advancements especially with the use of, of ai in plugins and there's things that you can do in the box that you can't do out the box. It's combining the two. So, you know, I might be surrounded by lots of analog equipment, but my desk that's here is an Avid S4, which is basically Pro Tools as a physical piece of hardware. And it's mm -hmm. all plug-in control. Um, and for, for me, it's a case of one's not better than the other. If you're, if you're working with plugins only, you're limited by the fact that analog has a superior tone and a superior sound. If you're working with analog only, you're not gaining all the aspects of the digital technology that is so much far better in some aspects to analog. Analog's, analog's old school. You know, analog's, it's not, you know, the, the, the way lots of these pieces of equipment work is, is it's been around for donkey's years. So mm -hmm. it's utilizing both. It's not a case of one or the other, use both because you will get a much yeah. better sound using both. Definitely. So what was your big break then? What was your, how did you get into like, you know, working with all the clients that you're doing? What, what, um, how did you start with that? So the, the big, Guess the, next. <laughs> the big, the big, big break for me was when I worked on Spider-Man 2. And that, that's an interesting story um, because it was like, I did Spider-Man 2 and I did it for free. You know, that sometimes you've got to work for free to get your foot in the door. Mm -hmm. um, I did Spider-Man uh, Spider 2 for, for free, didn't, didn't charge for it. And that was just because I could see the, the kind of the trajectory of what, what could be possible. And if I, if I'd have said, if I'd have said, oh yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll charge X amount of money. Um, and, and then I didn't get the job. Then I'm, I'm still back here. I'm still at square one where, where, whereas by just getting that one job off the back of that one job um a week later we done x-men you know and i i, I know 100 percent we would not have done x-men um had we not done spider-man because the two you know it was because we done spider-man that we got the phone call about x-men um and off the back of x-men then came x-men i think it was days of future past which was the one after that went straight on to that yeah another the other thing is like yeah like don't be disheartened from things like working for free all right it's 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 rubbish like we don't want to work for free no one wants to work for free because our time is valuable but sometimes weigh it up like i worked um i did a job yeah i did a job for little wayne uh, in the very very early days and we done it at like half price which is cool because you're you're gaining that client um, and if if they're sitting there going well this this person's going to do it for this much um can you do it for cheaper than that um and you go well you know if it's if it's dave down the road who's who's not not a big artist no we can't really um but if you're little wayne who can Put you on a trajectory to to bigger and better things by just having that client on your client list because at the end of the day the thing with a client list and i i don't i i dislike it when people say oh they put they for instance they put me in um articles and stuff as paul and then in brackets all the artists like you know i don't like all that because it's it's not necessary i don't find it's necessary but um 
I totally understand that, you know, you get ex clients, all these different high profile clients, your, your clients that are kind of, um, you know, just starting out or they're just doing their first songs, you know, they, they will look at that and go, wow, if they're good enough for them, they're good enough for me. So it does, you know, they, that, that does play a big part. And sometimes, you know, at the, at the beginning of things, you've got to win these big clients uh, by, by going in low and you will have to do that. But yeah, don't let that discourage you uh, in any way because we've, we've all had to work for cheap or nothing. And it's the same with like people who do DJing and stuff. It's like, you know, you know, you, you DJ for exposure, but then you get a booking off the back of it and it's like, all right, okay. I might have just DJed for nothing, but I've got a booking off of it that let's say for argument's sake, I've got a thousand pound for, well, let's just call that. I've got 500 pounds and I've got 500 pounds for that gig. And it's like, yeah, cool. Mm. Yeah, hundred percent. It's just knowing what you're going to do to be able to get out of what you're going to do for free, which is cool. Yeah, I mean, so don't with, don't with, do don't do like little tiny jobs for free, like little things that are yeah. just like, you know, if it's, if it's, if it, if you can see some sort of something coming from it, then there's no reason you can't work for for free or for for a kind of a cheaper rate, but just weigh it up as what is this worth to me, in comparison to you know, yeah. yeah. So with the uh, film industry, is it do they come to you and then they ask what your price is, or do you have to put a bid in for a film, or how does that work? Um, so yeah, you you it depends what the type of film is. If you're doing the, a feature film, the whole film, they'll come to you uh, and just be like, right, what's what? How much will you charge for for doing a feature film? And it's like, you know, it depends who it is as well. Is it's like if it's an independent you know, it's kind of like you, you're pricing it a lot lower because it's an independent um, film. If it's if it's Sony or um, Universal coming to you, you know, you price it up at the top end because the, the, the thing with films, and one thing I would say with films is there's, there's when it's a big film, there's no, there is a budget, but there's, there, there's more of a, it doesn't really matter. The end result has to be the best it can possibly be. They don't mind paying a lot for just to get the best result. And as well with the film, when you're doing like feature films, it is very, very difficult to get into because the majority of these big studios, they have everything in-house. Everything's taken care of in-house. Um, so we do a lot of um, like overdubbing in... Um, in uh, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, and all these sorts of places where they're basically the the film's already done, but we're doing the the film for um, and then it's all all the um, dialogues being overdubbed with some uh, for another country. So we do a lot of that, and that's 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 cool to do because you're still doing you're still doing a feature film. You're just doing the dialogue uh, to uh, to what is essentially the the um, the foley and instrumental tracks and stuff. And do you get given like live briefs? And will they go? I yeah. want it like this. Like yeah, that. yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, uh, well, yeah. Um, <coughs> a lot of it, you know, is is when it's that when it's the the dubbing aspect of it. You've you've already got a reference there. So you know, you've got you've got how it sounds for the English and American versions, and then it's just a case of um, making it exactly the same with a, a different dialogue. Um, so in that sense, there's, there is some, somewhat of a brief. Um, and sometimes, you know, it's sometimes difficult because, um, I, I use the, the English and American version to, to reference to, because I could obviously understand what's being said, um, in, in that version, whereas I can't obviously understand, um, Arabic and, um, that's an, another language that, so that, that has its, um, difficulties, but it's, you know, at the end of the day, I always see, audio is audio it's not you know it doesn't matter what it is it's like people ask me all the time with mixing music do you, do you mind mixing in a different language it's like no because i hear it as it's audio it's not it's not the words it's it's the way the words sound so it really doesn't matter um but yeah they you do get a brief um and with when you're doing like a a, a, big, a full feature film there's there's a lot backwards and forwards because 
as well is it, it really depends on the type of client you're working with because what ends up happening is you speak to one person, then they need to speak to their boss, then it goes to their boss, and <coughs> by the end of it, you know, 10 people down the line who actually gets to make the say, it then trickles back to you, and it's a long process some of the time. Which is why a lot of these you, companies, they do it all in-house and they have everything in-house. Yeah. And you get a lot of no's as well. You get a lot of setbacks and you have to change things um, around. Or do, do. Yeah, what, in terms of quoting someone um, for these sorts of jobs. Well, in, in, in general, when you're, right, when you're doing the music and doing all the mixing and stuff, is there a lot of like... When you said there's sort of back and forth, yeah, yeah, yeah. how do you like kind of... With, with everything. Um, with, with all... all whenever you're working with music if you're working with music working with film there's there's always revisions um like you'll get the the one in ten you know one in ten clients will be what i call the golden unicorn you know that they'll come along and they'll just you'll send the mix back and they'll go yep yeah, perfect let's go to mastering it's like hallelujah thank you god because that happens one in ten times you'll always get revisions because there's 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 certain aspect of artists um artist interpretation of something i can create a mix that that sounds perfect to me but it, it might not be the artist vision and you have to take in into account the the artist vision as well as your own um because ultimately they're they're who has the final say if they say that you know the uh, pads too loud or, or I want the snare drum louder it's like well yeah I mean there's no technical it's no there's no right or wrong there it's just a case of mm. that's how you intend it to sound and that's cool as long as it's no, not something really stupid like the vocals 10 dB louder it's like come on um, then you have to have that conversation between the two that you and the client of just kind of saying look this is a bit silly um here's the reasons why it will have a negative effect for xyz and um yeah just take it forward like that but you'll always get revisions and, and um i i always i always tell people especially young young engineers who are first kind of starting out is don't get disheartened by if if someone comes back to you with a, a list of 10 revisions uh, i get 10 revisions you know this it's not uncommon you know this it's that's that's just how how it is there's no there's nothing bad about having a revision because like i say is it's there's there's artist interpretation and also as well is you know they want to also feel like they've had the input into the mix so they're changing a few things mm. here and there and uh, that gives them their part of the mix um so there's there's that aspect of it as well and do you have to be like when you're working on um, some of the big films? Do you have to be super quiet? Are you allowed to tell anyone? Because I, oh, you know, yeah. I know a few friends who have to like they, they don't even know what kind of film they're working yeah. on until. But do you have to keep quiet about yeah. with everyone? Pretty much. There's lots of NDAs. I've got a, a, a pile mm. of NDAs down there, and um, yeah, there's lots of NDAs that you've you've got to kind of print out, sign and whatnot, but you know, that's all part and parcel of it, and yeah, there's a lot of the time, you know, we don't we don't get told, especially when we're doing big libraries, so we'll do like libraries of 40 tracks, for instance, and we'll master all these tracks, and they'll go back, and we won't know specifically where they're going, because they're obviously for libraries, so you'll be sitting there, like I've, I've gone to the cinema before, and it's a really nice experience to be sitting at the cinema, like I go to the cinema half an hour early to watch all the trailers, and to uh, to kind of like, is that one i done? No. <laughs> trying to, you know, um, and then you're sitting there with your phone shazamming it and trying to get find out what the track title is, and then you get back to the studio and you type it into your list of all these different uh, libraries that you've done, and say, like, oh yeah, that's that's all, that one we've done the trailer for that, and um, often you don't get told about it, like you know, you're, you're like for us, we're we're very low down the pecking order in terms of who who gets to see and know about all these different projects, um, so yeah, you, often you won't you won't find out about it i mean i i remember sitting there watching tv one day and um an advert came on and it was like wow I'd, I'd done that literally last week and it's like you know that's that's a magic feeling that is i really enjoy that and do you get like um do you get a fee for every time it plays or are you nah. do you just do a one-off fee yeah and that's it one off that's yeah one-off fee um we don't yeah we don't take anything for 
you know, there's some sometimes, you know, that can be factored into the project that, you know, it could be a case of that you get a little bit of it here, there, but it's it's usually very minuscule, especially on the film work. Um, but it, it, there is possibilities of that. Um, you know, I, I do enjoy getting a royalty check every now and then. It's it's nice. Um, gives me a holiday. <laughs> and, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's cool. And how approaching like doing a film with like luffs and stuff, is there much change between what you're doing with films and how you're mastering the films compared to like a, a, a music and yeah, it depends. And it really and stuff it, and computer games and things yeah. like that. Are they all different luffs. Well, the thing the thing is, these different territories will have different different luffs and things like that, and different formats will require different luffs. So what I always do in 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 that terms is I'll deliver the masters um, of the film. And then obviously now with Atmos, you've got to deliver the Atmos version, 7.1, 5.1. Thankfully, the renderer kind of renders all these things out for you, but there's still a big, long mastering process involved of, of all those files. Um, but what I tend to do is, what's great is to be able to deliver the, um, if I, I deliver the ADM file, what then can be done is, every every possible um speaker configuration can be extracted and rendered out of the adm file which is brilliant so now delivering that you know the 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 um whatever they want to do with it um they can then just kind of take take out of it whatever render they want and they can then perform a master if if it's like oh we need um we need a, a specific specification for like south korea or something like we're delivering it for this very very specific thing they don't then have to come to me um and say oh we need this and we need this it's like right just render out what you need offer the renderer um using the adm and then uh, basically, just master how exactly to the specifications that you need. That's amazing. That's yeah, amazing. It's, it's great. You, it's a good way to work. That's awesome. Um, how do you find time to do a YouTube channel as well on top of all this? <laughs> it's mad. Um, yeah, it's look. The <laughs> thing, the thing with like a YouTube channel is a lot of people will sit there and go, "Oh no, I can't be doing that." Like Nick, my business partner, it's it's something that's not for him. He doesn't he he doesn't enjoy speaking uh, publicly. Like him, think I don't know how many people are there, but like thirty, maybe twenty. Yeah. Him, him to sit and talk to thirty people, even if it's just me and you having a chat. But the, the, the kind of thought process of, oh, my God, 30 people are uh, sitting there watching me talk um, is very daunting for some people. And it is for Nick. And um, he's he doesn't like all that. Whereas I am I am a little bit more like I don't particularly like uh, or I didn't like. But I now I now really enjoy going on camera and talking and putting content together. It's, it's really enjoyable for me. I, I see it as therapy, to be honest. Um, because I just, you know, I get a lot of things off, off my chest, talk about different things and, uh, you know, you, you get locked away in a studio all day. It's nice to, even if you're just talking to a camera, uh, having, That's creating it. conversation, even if it is with yourself. But, um, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, you know, it's just something you have to do or you don't have to do it, but it will, it will push your business and your, um, your kind of status as a company that little bit further and a lot quicker. And I've noticed myself like, you know, um, I get since doing the YouTube channel, um, a lot more people come up to me at the, like I can be walking down the street and people have kind of come up to me and I always look the same. I just, you know, I always wear my own t-shirts. So, you know, um, People, people do often um, see me, and they they they, they recognise me from watching watching the YouTube channel, and that's I, I find that lovely. Um, like I was I was um, telling someone this morning, actually, the other night I was um, me and my daughter we got like VR headsets uh, on the Oculus, and we went in this thing, like chat rooms that, where you can go like to a cinema and you sit together in a cinema, and there was a chat room um, that was called Studio, so I went into this studio and then. Um, you know, as I walked in there, like my name on the Oculus is Audio Animals. So um, I walked into this like chat room studio and uh, there was a load of guys watching, uh, like producing music in this chat room. And they was like, oh my God, it's Audio Animals. Like, 
right. <laughs> and he's like in a virtual reality space, and uh, I just found it really surreal. And like, you know, those sorts of things that comes from doing YouTube content. And even even if I don't have technically the time to be doing it, um, I find it such a worthwhile thing to do that it's like I make time for it. Also, as well is in regards to making time for it is. The way I the way I do it is um, I've got a camera set up over there, and basically when when I you'll you'll notice in a lot of the videos um, there's stuff recording behind me. So with analog equipment you've got to record in real time. So if I've got a song like that's ten minutes long, or a song that's five minutes long, and I've got to do three different versions of it, and it adds up to fifteen minutes, I just hit record, spin around, shoot a video for ten minutes. By the time it's finished. You know, rather than just sitting there on my phone or something and just kind of waiting for it to finish recording. So I kind of work it into the day. But it's really That's worthwhile really cool. doing. One thing I will say is um, if, if, you've, if you're interested in something enough and you're open to going on camera, it's, it's really worthwhile doing the uh, YouTube content. I, 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 I wish I'd have done it earlier. And you're getting sent quite a lot of like review equipment as well? Is, yeah. Is that, is that I've that got... As well, yeah. Yeah, look. I've got one sitting there. It's oh. just, you know, Lush. it's like, um, yeah, but I get, I get sent all sorts of stuff. Oh, look, in the hope that I buy it, they know I'm a blooming, you know, gear addict. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they, they all hope that I'll buy it. And a lot of the time I do, I do keep the stuff that's sent. Um, but yeah, I, I, what's, what's really good, um, is you get sent a lot of stuff uh, f before release. So the lot mm. of stuff that I'll get, I'll have it like um, a month before it actually comes out, which is brilliant. I'm just not allowed to show it in any pictures. So if you ever see a, if you ever see like a, any of the videos where the camera's slightly panned to the left, not showing mm. this rack below me, it's because <laughs> it's sat there <laughs> and I have to take it out a shot. <laughs> But um, oh, yeah, it's, it's great to get it's great to get loads of uh, like a lot of um, gear before it actually comes out. And the other thing as well is, you know, if you when I'm buying equipment, I can I can use that as leverage uh, to get a really good price on equipment. You know, I get a lot of money off equipment because I say, look, you know, give me a good price. Um, you know, I, I'm going to shoot a video on it. What's 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 the best price you can do? And like nine times out of ten. They'll give you a discounted price, and they've always there's always wiggle room on the RRP. Um, so yeah, you can always get a, you can get a much better price, um, and especially when you're buying like you know if you're spending like ten grand on a compressor or a limiter or something, you know they, they, there's there's a good discount to be had. Um, so yeah, there's all that, and like the other thing with like plugins and stuff, I can't remember the last time I bought a plugin because when you've got when you like I'll, I'll review plugins. But it's like if I see a plugin that I want, I can I can approach the company and just go, look, I'm gonna shoot, I can shoot a review video on it. Can you send me an NFR? <coughs> Ninety nine percent of the time, it's like, yeah, cool. Here's the NFR, and uh, you've got the plugin. And you know, I only ever do that if if it's a plugin that I actually want, and I I, I look at it and it's like, yeah, this is actually a really good plugin. Um, and uh, yeah, they'll, they'll most of the time send you an NFR and um, you'll review it. You've got the plugin for free in exchange for it. And then, um, you know, I've got, got a few like uh, affiliate programs as well where, you know, you're getting 20% of every sale you make. But I, I categorically will never, ever, ever review a bad plugin and say it's good. Never would I do that. That's that's one thing. Like the only plugins that I review, or the only hardware I review, is high end and it's good stuff. I would never um, turn around and say something is good when it's not. Yeah, no, definitely. So our guys are at the very early stage of their musical career. Good luck. What kind of advice? Why? What, 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 um, uh, what advice would you give them? Run. <laughs> no. um, what advice would I give them um, at the very early stages of your music career uh, it's difficult There's the thing with this sort of industry is that look, everybody that's in it and everybody that's doing well in it um, they're, they're not necessarily in it or they originally didn't get into it for the money it's, it's a love thing 
Um, you've got to have that love for what you're doing. You've got to be prepared to work 10 times harder than the next guy. And basically, yeah, you can, if you're getting in this for the, for the, for the money or for the, and it's not for the passion, I think that's where a lot of people go wrong because if you're asked to work 18 hours every day for the next year, um, you know, you're not going to want to do that. Whereas that's heaven for me. So I'm going to want to do that. That's where I want to be. That's what I want to do. I, I, you know, working 18 hours a day, that's, that's like a day off for me. That's, that's what I want to be doing. Um, so there's always going to be people that are willing to work harder than you if you're not willing to work. And yeah, just basically, you know, it's quite easy for me to say work, work as hard as you can. It's, it's just, you know, that's, it's such an easy thing to say, but you really do have to really put your work in because there's, there's people who are in this who are highly passionate and they'll, they, if you're not working hard, they are. And they're gonna they're gonna take everything that you're you're wanting yourself. Yeah, no doubt. Um, the other, other <laughs> another question I want to ask is about deadlines. Oh right. Um, <laughs> how strict are, are the deadlines that you work with? And let's say you missed it by just a second or a minute. How how important is that within your your um, career? To be honest, I'll, I'll be one hundred percent. I don't think I've ever missed a deadline. Because I work, I generally work <clears throat> a day before. Especially the one good thing is if you're working with clients in LA, which we do a lot, and the most of the deadlines all come from the film work. It's like, yeah, we need it tomorrow. That's cool because mm -hmm. we're eight hours in front of you. So we've just, we've already got eight hours on you. So they need it when they wake up. But when they wake up is our six o'clock in the afternoon. So we've had all day to work on it. So the, the deadlines are generally uh, quite easy to meet when you're working with that side of the world. When you're working with the other way, um, which is less often in terms of film, um, yeah, you're up against the clock. But I always tend to, in regards to deadlines, try and be a, at least a day before the deadline. So you, you'll always deliver a day before. And that way, you know, yeah, it just leaves it leaves you 24 hours if if they come back and go, oh, we need a revision. You, you've got that 24 hours, whereas I don't think I've ever been an hour before a deadline like, oh, we've got to deliver it. Because at the end of the day, you can't deliver your best work if you're rushing things, especially in this line of industry. Mm hmm. Thanks for uh, clearing that up for us. <laughs> we, we try and drill our, our students about like hitting, hitting deadlines and stuff all the time and how important it is. To well, within, it's, it's, like when we, uh, it's, it's like when we were talking about um, coming onto this Zoom call, um, I mm -hmm. said I'll be ready five minutes before. You know, because I, I was taught at a very young age, if you're not five minutes early, you're five minutes late. Mm. And that's mm. that's something that's that's very important because you know so what if you sit there for five minutes staring at a screen waiting for something get on your phone just do something you know mm. but it shows it shows that nobody wants to wait for someone you know mm -hmm. if 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 there's someone who's always late for something and they're known for being late you just you end up phasing them out it's just like I can't be bothered with with people being mm -hmm. late for something. Um, okay, cool. So, um, someone was asking about a mastering chain that you would use for for your mixing, because obviously they're doing mixing and mastering. What what kind of how would it look? What would your mixing chain look like? Uh, so, mastering chain. Um, yeah, yeah, mastering chain. I mean, I I have I'm surrounded by EQs. Um, I've, mm -hmm. I'm very much um, I've got lots of EQs. And that's mainly because what I always aim to achieve is certain EQs have certain characteristics that are good in certain bands. And I, I find like I've got an SPLP EQ there, which really good in low end. There's a, a Golly EQ there, which is um, more subtle and everything's used slightly different. And most people will sit there and think well if you've got eight eqs how can you use eight eqs you'd have like you know you probably got about 
I don't know, let's say 30 bands of EQ. No one's going to use, no one uses 30 bands of EQ unless the mix is <laughs> massively wrong. Um, so it's, it's a case of being selective over the bands that you do have. And that's, that comes with time. You'll, you'll gain knowledge and it's not a case of, I don't, I don't like just having one EQ because you're fixed to one sort of characteristics. Um, I like having a few EQs. Like I've got, um, I've got an EQ coming, which is the Carnaby HE2, which is a harmonic EQ, and that's totally different to all the other EQs that are in here. And I'll probably only just literally nudge it a little bit, and I probably won't end up using it massively to its full potential. But what I will use it for is just to add harmonics, probably in the highs, maybe a bit in the bottom. So it's a case of, um, although I've got lots of EQs, it's you don't need them all. It's a luxury position that I'm in where, where you know, and as well, like you said, we talked about before, lots of companies send down lots of pieces of equipment and I get lots of pieces of equipment. I don't like to see it go. I've had to build another studio. So I've got a third studio we're building at the moment because um, I've got, there's so much equipment that I, I love, but it doesn't quite make it into this chain or Studio A. And it's like, well, let's build a third studio so it can all go in there. Um, like the black box here, I've got the um, HE, um, HE, HG2. That's a brilliant saturator. Um, but I've got the uh, Michelangelo XL that we built with Handy Amps, and that's, that's coming soon, and that's going to directly replace that. But I don't want to lose the HG2. I want to, so I'm, I'm literally putting it straight into this other studio. So in terms of the mastering chain, though, um, yeah, it's just a case of if you wanted to start a mastering chain with analog equipment, there's there's multiple pieces of equipment um, plugins that can do 95% of the job out the box. Um, the the one aspect that I think is really good to have outside the box is saturation. Um, that's one thing that in the digital world isn't quite there. An EQ can, because it is just curves, you know, there's, there's, the, it is quite easy to copy that using an EQ in the box. So, you know, if you were looking at something that you had to get out the box, um, something like the Rupert Neve MBT is a brilliant one to start with because it gives you this really nice saturation. Um, and that's that's one thing that I would say definitely do out of the box. Like limiting, I've got the low limiter here, and they're nine grand, which is stupid money for for a limiter. And you could do that in the box. Like you could do that with a plugin. It doesn't sound as good, but it's you know it's ninety percent there. Um, only go and buy like the really expensive stuff if you're you know if you're in a position where you can you can warrant paying that. But like. You know, someone. I was talking to someone the other day, and it was like I. They was asking like, how much the studio costs. It was like I could probably sell the studio now and go and buy a, a house quite easily, and have money left over to get a Ferrari. Um, so it's like, you know, these things are expensive. So be very selective of what you actually go and get, because sometimes you can get ninety five percent there in the box, and if there's one thing you want to be out the box using it's it's things that are unique and unique to being out the box so like and the other thing the one thing i will say on on um on a mastering chain is there's always this uh, the saying that you're owning as good as your weakest link when it comes to the mastering chain like you could have the best eq you could have the best compressor uh the best limiter the best everything on the mastering chain and then use a focus right 2i2 as your interface and <coughs> You know, it's like it's like it's like having a Ferrari and then putting putting some old skiddy tires on it. You're just going to be all over the place. Um, yeah. So yeah, you're only as good as your weakest link. So you know, buy the, like if if all if all you can afford, for instance, when you start out is is kind of a little bit more budget end. Um, try and try and have equal amounts, like equal across the whole range so if it's a budget if you're on a budget converter don't have a 10 grand compressor because you're not going to get the most out of it 
you know, if arguably you could say, like, get the best converter you can possibly get and then try and afford whatever else can go in that mastering chain. But yeah, definitely a case of you are only as weak, uh, only as good as your weakest link. Um, yeah, converters are really important. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, definitely. Converters, lush. Next question. Love that. Can I um, buy a work placement? Do you do work placements? Um, <laughs> not really. There's a reason we do like a, the reason we wanted to do an online business is to remove, remove, to be able to, uh, to do like a, create an affordable service <clears throat> for the clients. There's certain things that we don't have to pay like we don't have to pay um for uh what do they call it um can't think what they call the, the type of insurance for when people are coming in and out of a business um, like business liability. liability insurance so we haven't got to pay all the liability insurance because we don't have people coming in um and it's and that so when it comes to things like that, if you were to get someone who on a, on a workplace, for instance, um, we have done it before, but there've been more people who are coming in as, as friends. It's very difficult to get work placements. Um, and it is, it is really difficult because as well as unless the person that's coming in is, is, is very knowledgeable and can actually, um, can actually, uh, kind of, benefit your working day um it's not financially beneficial to us for instance to get someone if someone like i get asked all the time oh can i come in and shadow you well no because what i'm working on requires ndas and i can't just sign anyone up like if for instance if i was working with sony or universal or saying and i said oh yeah i've got um i've got this um this guy coming in who's um you know he's just starting out can we stick him on the nda they'll go no definitely not because you know the the reason they come to us is is as a, as a trusted brand to then put put someone who we if we don't know uh they certainly don't know and it throws up some issues so yeah we don't really do any any kind of um any workplace things like that but there's lots of studios that do um but yeah it's it's really it, it is really difficult to get the experience and i always say to people if you want the experience create the experience create create the job and go and get the experience like even fake it till you make it you know just 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 go and do it if if you know best way to learn is to to make mistakes and uh, learn from those mistakes um get practical with 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 projects you know if 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 no one's coming to you and you haven't got a client base offer yourself to your uh, to your mates you've got plenty of producer mates around you start working on their stuff they you know if you're working with your producer mates for instance doing all their mixing whatever <coughs> And then their, one of their friends hears that song and goes, wow, that mix sounds incredible. Who done that? Hopefully they'll go, they won't take credit for it. They'll, they'll say, oh, yeah, this guy. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I, 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 could, would he mix my song? Yeah, 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 of course you will, yeah. I'll get in touch with him. And then, you know, you get, you get one client. And then it, it, it's like a pyramid scheme in the sense that it just, just grows. And, you know, that person says something to that one. And, you know, as long as you're doing a good job with what you're doing, it's, it's just going to grow. Definitely. Love that. Love that. Next question. So where, where's your, what does your process start when you get given a uh, project to work on? What's your first process of approaching, you know, starting that project? Would it be, would, would you look at the planning of the sounds? Would you, well, what would you, um, how would your process at the beginning the the process the the first initial process is when you if for instance we we talk about mixing um is getting the stems and then assessing whether the stems <clears throat> are actually correct and uh, the playbacks correct and I, I one one thing if you are mixing for someone always get them to send you their stereo mix of how their song is finished the amount of times i cannot tell you the amount of times that 
I receive stems, I hit play, it sounds like rubbish, and then I listen to the reference, or they haven't sent a reference, so I request the reference of how their finished song sounds. It's like, yeah, you've left out all your automation, you've left out ev all your sound design, it's it's basically raw as anything. Um, oh yeah, sorry, I forgot to put um, all like my plugins on. It's like, who who gets to the end of a song, finishes a song, mix, like creating a song, and then goes, oh, you know what, I'm going to turn everything off now. It's, it doesn't make sense. So, without having that reference, you you wouldn't you wouldn't know because you're listening to it for the first time. You're trusting that when you hit play that playback is going to be correct. So without a reference, always get them to send you a stere the stereo mix of how they have the finished song and then reference from A to B to that. And if the playback of the stems is, let's say, 95% there, it sounds pretty much as it is, then then you can start on with the mix. And yeah, that's that's really where I, where I start because... Um, Without that reference, and if, if the stems are sent wrong, and you don't know they're sent wrong, um, you could send the mix back and they'll go, it sounds, it sounds terrible. It's like, well, why does it sound terrible? What's, what's, what's the issue? Oh, that delay I put at 33 seconds isn't in there. Well, did you send that delay? Did I have any inclination that there was a delay at 33 seconds? You know, and it's like, what type of delay? If I am to put it in, what type of delay is is supposed to be in there? Because a lot of things like that, it's it all comes down to the artistic um, interpretation of of things. Same with like automation. If oh the the drum was meant to filter from there to there, how did I know? It's like you you there's, there's that's all artistic. It's not um it's not something that's an engineer's. Like, yes, as an engineer, we can do that. That's perfectly fine. But to know you want that done, um, we, we don't know, unless there's a reference to say that, or you actually physically say in any mix notes. So the first thing, the first approach, is to assess that what you're working with is, is correct, because the last thing you want to do is work on something that's not correct, and then they're like, oh, yeah, no, oh, sorry, I'll, I'll resend you stems. Uh, right, okay you're not going to pay twice so now i've got i've just done wasting all my time doing that so i one thing the first thing to do is assess that what you're working with is correct first of all and don't don't ever start if you've got any sort of any kind of um if you think maybe it's right maybe it's wrong just ask make sure it's right before you even start because otherwise uh -huh. you're just wasting your time you end up just yeah yeah I can't tell you the amount of times that I've wasted my time with with stuff like that. <laughs> it it's crazy. How did you feel that I'm a massive Disney fan? How did you feel when Wish came along? <laughs> I need to ask well, that. Yeah, like like we done. Um, you, I, I would have thought um, Disney would have like stayed in the house. Yeah, well, the, that's, you, that was a trailer. Happy. So th th those sorts of things where we do um, we do like libraries of trailers, for instance. Um, so if we're doing like libraries of of music, we we don't know that it's for that. The library house most probably don't know it's for that. They're pitching all these songs, and uh, Disney kind of go, "That's the song," and they've picked that song that we've done. And it's it, it is it's totally it's not at random, but they're they're obviously selecting the the right song that goes with the thing. And and it was the same with doing Frozen too. You know, um, we had no no knowledge of that um until we actually heard it and then we were like oh brilliant yeah perfect um so yeah the people like disney like you say all in house you'll be very lucky to you would have to literally go and work with disney um directly to actually kind of get any of those big big jobs with disney but when it comes to like the trailers any tv spots anything like that all the music that's in the actual film um that that can always uh, be um stuff that's for um from tra uh, from library music um but yeah the hardest thing with doing library music is actually finding out what what films it's actually been in because you know I'm the last person they tell you know I have to go and find out for myself 
It's not like they come back next week with another library and say, oh yeah, by the way, uh, this, 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 and this was in, in this, 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 this film. It's, it's like, it, it, that doesn't happen. I mean, we can ask, but it's, it's a, it would probably be a pain for them to kind of go back through. So um, what, we, what we end up doing is um, all the library companies that we work with, we, um, we follow on Facebook and Instagram and um, they, most of them have got like a news blog on their website and every now and then just have a little look and go, oh, right, there's, there's one, there's another one, there's another one. Um, and then like most, most of the library companies that we work with, we do every single song they put out. So it's like if they put put um, you know half the time you don't even have to listen. It's just like yep, there's there's another one, there's another one, and um, yeah. I mean, what's what's brilliant is I've now got to the point which this this is amazing, is that um, the client list has got so long with the amount of films that I'm like, ah, that one's not a big enough film to go on. Which uh, look, trust me, that that's that's a really amazing position to be in. Um, yeah, and I, 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 I didn't think I'd ever be there, to be honest. That's amazing. That's amazing. Okay, all right, we've got time for one more. If anyone wants to ask one more question, go on. Have you had, a, like, a, a project crash on you? <laughs> <laughs> I, had a project, working, I had a project crash um, on me yesterday. <laughs> um, okay. No, I tell you, um, yeah, every now and then you'll have a project crash on you. Um, the advice I'd give in, in regards to the projects crashing is, um, there's quite a few things actually, is obviously you've got autosave on, on most doors now, have an autosave every five minutes. The one time that the autosave won't work is if you haven't pressed stop. So it'll only auto save if there's nothing playing. So, um, well, this is the case with Pro Tools. So, if you're if you're looping something for, <clears throat> let's say, 20 minutes, the auto save won't kick in until you hit uh, pause, and then it will save as you hit pause. Um, so sometimes you can obviously be sitting there processing for 20 minutes, for instance, over the same loop. It's not always the case, but. Um, that there is the potential with that and uh, the auto save won't work um the other thing is um yeah if you're working with lots of clients have backup hard drives and then try and have a backup of that hard drive as well so there's two places because i have had um i at one point i did lose this was this was about five years ago and like i said at the beginning is this, uh, this um you learn from your mistakes and I've had in the past where two months worth of work that had been put on a backup drive, uh, the drive just failed <clears throat> and th there was no recovery in it. And we tried to use recovery data and we just, what we just had to do was just because it was a backup drive, we just had to pray that no one in that time period of that two months ever needed to open their sessions again. Um, so yeah, that's that's another one. Um, what other what other tips? Um, yeah, I think that's about it. There, there's probably a lot more. There's there's probably a few more of uh, yeah. <sighs> but it's 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 horrible when a crash happens. Yeah. Just make sure you know the the one the one thing is you've got Control S. Just just every now and then, if you just think a bit, just just Control S. But things do crash. Well, the other thing as well is. Um, you'll find <clears throat> that if you're using fully legit plugins and everything's legit, everything's a license, everything's up to date, everything's good to go, you'll find you'll get very little crashes. Um, and it's only cracked plugins, for instance, you'll find you'll get crashes all the time. Um, so, you know, keep keep your computers clean, keep, keep them up to date, keep, well, don't actually keep them up to date because stay one OS <laughs> behind. Um, yeah, just all that's one real vital tip is stay one OS behind because um, especially if you're on Mac, um, yeah, because it's it's a pain. I've had it. I've had it Nine before. Mac. I had it before with um, um, with one, and I I always keep one OS behind. But when you buy a new computer, you're kind of forced onto the new OS. Uh, that's the latest OS. Um, so that's the only time I've ever had any issue with having to go 
forward an OS um, and then yeah and then I, just find something that's stable and then just 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 that's stick it. with that uh, that's what I've always found has been been the best way to do it I love it man thank you so much for today it's been no amazing worries. it's been a pleasure talking to you man um, I think some of our students might want to get hold of you at some point to like kind of send some of the stuff that they've been doing, if that's all right. Yeah, 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 of course, yeah. Um, one thing that a lot of people uh, send me is um, uh, questions for their uh, dissertations. So if anyone, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm more than happy Happy. to uh, answer any questions in an email. Um, yeah, just, just obviously send my email out. Um, I might cut this bit from the video because I'll get everyone from, yeah. <laughs> from the video emailing it. To, I'll get I'll get flooded with it. Um, yeah, I don't, of course. If um, if there's any questions anyone's got um, and they want to just uh, for their dissertations or whatever, um, and you want to fire them over? Yeah, just send them over, direct them to me. All and, right, uh, cool. More well, than let's happy. Let's say thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, superstar. Thank My you, superstar. pleasure. Um, and thanks so much for your time again, man. No worries. Any time. We'll do All it right, again we'll sometime. Some... Just let me man. know. All right, Take good care. stuff. Keep safe. Speak soon. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye-bye.